If you've clicked on this video, you may be one of many things. Perhaps you have a long, greasy black fringe, black eye makeup, and one of many potential abhorrent piercing choices. Maybe you drape yourself in oversized flannel shirts whilst having perhaps the most pretentious mustache and eyewear combination possible. Despite these two individuals being incredibly different in terms of visual style, they are both somehow considered to be quote-unquote emo. That seemingly makes zero sense. They appear to be completely different but both visually and ideologically. This conundrum is furthered when we look towards the various styles of music labelled as emo. On one side of the spectrum we have pop punk with some whiny individual viciously complaining about being born and raised in this idyllic town. And on the other side we have this. So this may immediately raise a question, how come the label of emo stretches to so many different styles of music, fashion and subculture, and which one can truly be considered as a real emo? So before we explore the history of the emo subculture and how it's definition is skewed into any and every direction, let's look into what the common understanding of what an emo is in the modern day. So if you were to simply google the word emo, you are presented with a definition which reads, somebody who is overly sensitive, emotional and full of angst. If we then focus our attention to the first few results on google images, you are visually harassed with somebody that resembles this or this. So naturally if we're to trust our google overlords, we have our answer of what a true emo is. Unfortunately it's not that easy. Google Google's top result is based on popularity and not true based factual information, meaning we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper to truly find out what an emo is. Emo, much like the vast majority of alternative subcultures, has always been inherently linked to music and saw its birth through the development of a niche microgenre. Specifically, in emo's case, the genre would see its accidental birth within the DC hardcore scene with the band Rites of Spring. At the time, the scene was incredibly masculine and heavily politicised, with the vast vast majority of bands at the time just angrily cussing out Ronald Reagan whilst popping a few forehead veins on stage. This routinely resulted in fights breaking out at concerts. This obviously alienated individuals within the scene who weren't the embodiment of animalistic rage, leading to bands like Rites of Spring switching up the subject matter within the music to something more introspective and melancholic. Although the music still remained within the confines of hardcore's instrumentation for the most part, bands would still decide to slow that shit it down a bit, introducing more melodic elements and shying away from any outward politicised rage. This resulted in a style of music that was inherently emotional, although completely avoiding the Joseph Rogue and Ice Bath Rage type of emotion. Bands like Rites of Spring and Embrace focused more so on introspection, desperation and rejection. This style of music was quickly dubbed Emotional Hardcore or Emo Core by Thrasher Magazine and this got the exact response you'd expect from the bands with the vast majority of these artists artists simply calling the term <laughs> As the years slowly ticked away, emo core continued to become further alienated from the scene that originally birthed it, resulting in the music becoming more distinct. It wasn't particularly the subject matter that differed emo from hardcore, it was more so the way in which each subject was tackled. Hardcore took the physical route, violently running headfirst into all subject matters before receiving a nasty concussion, whilst emo essentially did the musical equivalent of trauma dumping online. Although Although emo core had fully defined itself at this point in time, it wasn't anything more than just a subgenre of music, with no real unique or distinct subculture attached. It all just kind of blended in and out of hardcore. A member of the emo core community was essentially indistinguishable from a typical hardcore kid. So what is a typical hardcore kid? Hardcore punk subculture at the time essentially just wore normal clothing, using this style to rebel against the outlandish nature of punk fashion beforehand. As the 90s chugged along, bands like Nirvana made alternative music instantaneously more mainstream friendly, I'd assume by doing sh** like this, meaning songs and bands that utilised aspects of the early emo core scene were able to chart and reach the ears of more people. Examples include Smashing Pumpkins, Pearl Jam and Nine Inch Nails, who were able to utilise aspects of emo lyricism and ideology. Despite not actually being emo, these bands were able to introduce young people to aspects that would eventually inspire f this. It does kind of seem like we're forgetting something, however. <laughs> 
Midwest emo and the niche subculture that was birthed alongside it appears to be something that's entirely antithetical to what the typical representation of an emo would become in the modern day. You know, this mother <laughs> is rarely in the same ballpark as this mother <laughs> let alone concert venue. Despite this, Midwest emo actually came to prominence years before anyone saw fit to rock this abhorrent excuse for an outfit. 1989 would see emo's first flurry into the Midwest with the band Cap'n Jazz. Their music would take the sound of emo core before and release it from its post-hardcore prison, introducing more indie and arty elements, making the sound more accessible and interesting for individuals not obsessed with power chords and male pattern boldness. Although Cap'n Jazz were minuscule in terms of a global or even national fanbase, they built enough of a dedicated cult following around the Midwest to inspire hordes of eventual emos, who may have been completely unaware of the hardcore-based subgenre beforehand. Cap'n Jazz were quickly followed by bands such as Sunny Day Real Estate, American Football, Braid, and the eventual Cap and Jazz spin off, The Promise Ring. The emerging genre was able to capture the hearts of emotional teenagers all across America, perhaps becoming the first art form to truly spread the emo subculture to people outside of just one secular scene. This would, however, be extremely short lived as Midwest emo's popularity was quickly swallowed up by the music that would eventually inspire the most commonly recognized incarnation of emo. Despite this, the genre has managed to build its underground popularity in the 30 years or so since its inception. Bands like American Football have seen their popularity and influence skyrocket thanks to the internet allowing for seamless music discussion and distribution across the globe. This resulted in more modern bands playing and developing on the style of music. It has reached a point where the Midwest emo subculture and fashion is perhaps as prominent amongst young people as the style of emo that reared its greasy head in the early 2000s which subsequently means we are introduced to the first realistic contender when discussing what characterizes a real emo. Much like emo core before it, Midwest doesn't have a style and subculture as recognizable as this, but it still does have some recognizable traits. Due to the location of the genre's birth, members of the subculture are often more interested in nature and getting their filthy mitts on various versions of icky sticky green stuff. They also tend to fit more into the nerd stereotype, you know, Weezer type mother perhaps due to the genre's focus on consistently harassing the listener with various forms of complicated music theory and virtuosic playing. Despite not being instantly recognisable, there is an argument to be made that the subculture born out of Midwest emo can be considered real emo, mainly due to its early development and subsequent success in recent years. Although when we look towards the popularity, it pales in comparison with the emo explosion in the early 2000s. Every incarnation of an emo after this point differ greatly from previous, not only in visual style and attitude, but sheer scale and eventual hive mind that follows. In just over 10 years, an emo had morphed from a hardcore kid who had just had his heart broken, to a nerd obsessed with guitar technique who had just had his heart broken, all the way to a black fringed, skinny jeaned, eye makeup have an ass individual, devoid of any testosterone the subculture may have originally had, who had also just had his heart broken. Seems like a bit of a jump with no clear explanation. Well, luckily for you, there's a clear explanation. Whilst a good portion of the emo population in the 90s had developed the genre by violently tapping the neck of their guitar, another healthy portion began violently screaming instead, forcing the genre into chaos as opposed to indie bliss. This havoc would begin to blossom within the San Diego screamo scene, with bands like Heroin, Antioch Arrow, and Swing Kids, who were not only influential to emo in terms of music, but the way in which they presented themselves. This haircut became so synonymous with within the scene that many began to label the genre as Spock Rock. You see, many of the developments within emo fashion came as a direct rebuttal of the hyper-masculine image created by the typical slaphead hardcore artist. Examples of this include Refused and 18 Voices. The latter would specifically be instrumental to the development of the emo style from this to this. The band would focus on femininity in terms of clothing, wearing tight black garments, straightening their hair into long fringes, and utilizing black makeup. Fashion had become such a cornerstone of the band and the culture surrounding it that they attracted the label Fashion Core, which subsequently saw a small scene of bands who began to focus more of their efforts towards the visual. This style of music and dress quickly began to receive criticism by much of the hardcore community. It was perceived as the dilution of hardcore into the mainstream, leading to many new fans of the subculture having various insults thrown at them, one of which being the term Scene Queen. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the original definition of a scene queen is essentially a conventionally attractive, popular woman who is only involved in the hardcore scene for its perceived coolness and the attention they may receive as a result of their inclusion. It seems the individuals who originally utilised this term as an insult may have made a huge mistake as they accidentally spawned this individual into our collective consciousness, resulting in an entirely separate subculture with the label scene. Scene took inspiration from the bubbling emo culture in the early 2000s, morphing it into something similar, although slightly more annoying. Scene became so synonymous with emo at the time that many individuals to this day confuse the two subcultures, although I find there is one simple way to differentiate the two. Emo is sad, Scene is happy. Scene fashion often involves extremely bright colours, essentially taking the style of 18 visions beforehand and combining it with an unhealthy amount of rave culture, creating a style and subculture that is truly revolting. Due to the subculture's commercial viability, stores that took advantage of counterculture like Hot Topic began filling their shelves full of scene-like garments. This alongside early e-celebrities and MySpace spread the culture to a wide variety of people. Although there is one alarming issue when attempting to label a scene queen as an emo, they are not emotional. If we're to explore the origins of emo and how it developed through the late 20th century, they were always sad, always emotional. If we're going by its original definition and history, it's safe to say that scene was just a blip in the emotional timeline and cannot be labelled as true emo. So it seems like we have one more incarnation of emo to explore. Pretty much everything explored previously in this video leads us directly to the early 2000s emo. The subculture is essentially a rancid stew of every element we've explored so far. Take the inevitable development of hardcore music into the pop realm, add the visual style of 90s screamo, pour in the inevitable maidenless state of Midwest emo, and even introduce various elements of past genres such as Indian goth, and you have a delicious emo stew. Essentially, any past counterculture style of dress became an element of the eventual explosion of the emo subculture. So how come emo exploded in popularity if each of these individual elements on their own remained underground in the past and are still relatively unknown to this day? Well, it's essentially entirely thanks to big fat stacks of f***ing cash. As pop punk began to break into the mainstream and subsequently received the label of emo, every culture-based business owner in America realised how marketable the music and style was. This over-commercialisation of the sub culture led to its explosion of popularity. Emo was no longer linked to a particular type of music, age group or location. Literally anyone with enough disposable income to waste on pop culture t-shirts and hairspray could become an emo. This allowed it to spread at a much faster rate, resulting in this becoming the most commonly recognised definition of emo today. Emos had become inherently connected to the products they were being sold. Gone were the times that emo entirely relied on the music's subject matter or emotional state of the individual involved. In the eyes of the public and mainstream news, it was pretty much a visual trend alongside a flurry of sensationalised articles exploring emo's supposed depressive traits. That being said, away from the watchful eyes of boomers, emo and its culture became celebrated almost entirely throughout the internet. The coinciding popularity of websites like MySpace allowed the culture to grow through online means. The subculture that was loosely linked to emo pop and the website that originally focused much of its efforts on the promotion of band culture were a perfect match, allowing emo to become the most discussed subculture on the website. The internet obviously means more eyes, resulting in the culture becoming so widespread and prominent that it took emo from an entirely niche offshoot of separate subcultures to perhaps one of the most mainstream subcultures on the planet. More people often means the ideas dilute and stretch into different ideologies and personalities, making emo in the modern day hard to define. We are now at the point in the video where we have explored each and every major incarnation of an emo, and how the subculture has evolved since the invention of the original music genre. So which one of these can be truly considered a real emo? This is a question that's difficult to definitively answer, as it requires us to define what an emo actually is. If we're to define the term by simply exploring its history, it refers to somebody who is a fan of the particular genre of music, although the definition falls flat on its face when looking towards the widespread appeal of emo in the early 2000s. 
thousands, which reached far beyond just fans of a particular genre of music. If we're to explore the definition by simply breaking down the etymology of the term, it refers to somebody who is emotional and oversensitive to said emotions, so if we're to use that definition, we can easily label half the young population as emo. Neither of these definitions seem to fit, and perhaps emo is subject to the inevitability that comes with popularity. As an idea begins to reach the mind of more and more bug people, its original qualities die down and merge with the personality traits, background and identity of each individual involved. I think it's safe to say if you consider yourself to be an emo, you're probably an emo. Whether you have a long black fringe, an obnoxiously brightly coloured beanie or a multicoloured abomination that some consider a haircut, the inherent emotion felt when listening, viewing or interacting with the previous incarnations of emo have obviously led you to looking like an absolute and if the pipeline from consuming a certain piece of media to making vast amounts of mistakes isn't a perfect definition for what an emo is, I don't know if anything is.